Hey soccer fans, welcome back to the Feed the Fire podcast. I'm your host Nick and we have tons to talk about after the Chicago Fire get their first win of the season. A little St. Paddy's Day luck of the Irish going on here in Chicago, that's for sure. We're going to look ahead to their next match against the New England Revolution. We've got a virtual lightning round of headlines and fire news updates on the Open Cup and Olympic team call-ups, so make sure you stay tuned for all of this and more. Hey soccer fans, once again, Nick, your host here on the Feed the Fire podcast brought to you by Glass House Soccer. Thank you all for joining me again, especially after the wild, windy St. Patrick's Day weekend that took place downtown, helping the Chicago Fire get their first win of the season against CF Montreal, a team that had probably been outperforming a lot of people's expectations up to this point, and then everything kind of just fell apart on this blustery day at Soldier Field. Before we dive into the recap, a couple quick housekeeping notes. I want to thank Ryan for answering all the Spotify polls that we put out there. The hosting platform allows questions and polls, and I appreciate you jumping in, Ryan, wherever you're at, giving me your comments and feedback. Also, a programming reminder, go check out goals.tv, G-O-L-Z.tv, where Glasshouse Soccer and I am doing a recap show, scoreboard watch, standings review, Uh, After every weekend of games, just kind of giving everyone the big picture of what's going on around MLS, you can only find that video, and they're only about, you know, 10-12 minutes long, over on Goals TV. Now, turning our attention to the big news from the weekend, the Chicago Fire get a 4-3 victory over CF Montreal, first on the season, and they get this win in spite of of themselves and I think it's the best kind of win because they played terribly but they still got the win and they can there's a lot of takeaways and things that they can work on this week now don't get me wrong I celebrated as much as anyone when that final whistle blew when that final whistle finally blew because as CF Montreal fans have been quick to point out There was a lot of stoppage time. I think 22 minutes of stoppage time total in that match. But you know what? My sons and I enjoyed it. We couldn't stop laughing at that Kellen Acosta goal. But after a weekend reflection, it really was a pretty terrible match overall. Neither team really deserved to win. You know, from the Fire's perspective, Frank Klopas trotted out the same lineup as he has the last several weeks the same lineup that can't produce much offense and honestly how they got four goals here is, is nothing short of a small miracle in Chicago, right? The Fire played, despite owning the possession stats, they played pretty poorly, I would say, for 70 to 80 minutes out of this match. And in fact, Montreal looked to be the better team those first 20 minutes and were rewarded. They were rewarded, let me enunciate here, with those two penalty kicks early on after some Chicago Fire blunders. And yes, the officiating was terrible. Though it was great to kind of be on the receiving end of some of the bad officiating calls that favored our team, actually. Um, And speaking of officiating, let's address it really quickly. Montreal fans can be pissed all they want about how terribly the referees were, how they lost them the game, how Chris Brady should have gotten a dog so, which go back and read the uh, rules. I don't know if it actually would have been a dog so. It, It might have been reduced to a yell card, especially because... Uh, there's a lot of question as to whether his handball that wasn't called actually prevented a goal from being scored because the ball did kind of hit him on the backside before hitting his hand, and then is it really a handball? And you get into all that interpretation, a lot of gray area in that play. Uh, there's, But you got to remember, for all the things that went against Montreal, you still blew a two-goal lead in 20 minutes of play, right? You were up 2 nothing after two penalty kicks were called in your favor, so don't come at the ref. Yes, you can. They were terrible, but don't blame them solely for how bad Montreal botched that game for the next 70-plus minutes, right? Sirost, Sirah, Siro, K Sirah, Sirah, I guess. The Montreal goalkeepers still had to blunder that Acosta skyball uh, in order to give the fire the win there. Also, here's an educational moment for everyone out there, not just the Montreal fans, because one of their points of contention was on the throw-in 
from Tehran, the long throw leading to Kuiper's goal to draw level for the fire. Tehran was on the line. He was stepping on the touchline, and like half of his foot was actually in the field of play. So they were saying that's an illegal throw. You can't be touching the line. You got to be behind the line. Nope, not true. If you look up the IFAB rules and the laws of the game, here, let's see what the specific language says. The thrower, the person taking the throw in, must have a part of each foot on the touchline or on the ground outside the touchline. So Tehran was completely within the rules when he stepped on the line because his one foot was on the line, his, his other foot was behind the line. Now, if any foot was completely over the touchline and into play, then yes, it would have been an illegal throw. And if you think of it, it kind of makes sense because in order for a ball to be considered out of bounds or to have scored a goal by crossing the touch the end line, it has to completely cross the line. So Tehran, by not completely crossing the touchline into play, was still out of play. I guess that's one way you can think it. Maybe they're not. that's not the intent of it. Maybe that's not how the rule was actually written, or at least with that in mind. But again, the rule states, as long as you're on or behind the line, you are good to go. So Tehran's throw was absolutely legal. Uh, and I encourage everyone to go find the IFAB Laws of the Game app. Very useful when you're watching game and hearing ridiculous comments on Twitter. And again... Montreal fans, you can be upset, but it was your sub, the former fire player, Raheem Edwards, who just threw a blatant elbow at Kutsius. And yes, that is egregious. That is willful misconduct. That is reckless. It is dangerous. It is all the definition of a red card when you just throw an elbow at a player. And so that was deserved, a deserved red card for Edwards, a deserved PK because the fire were in possession. Kutsius was in the box when he was fouled. Some people are saying it should have been um, an indirect free kick awarded to the fire, but given the fact that there's still play going on and the fire had possession, if I recall, then I, I don't think the referee made, made the wrong call in that situation. Um, a lot of people are saying that, well, Kutsius pushed him first. Where was the foul there? Are you kidding me? Like, guys jockeying for position in the box. Like, if you, you really want to call that every time. And you all know, it's the second guy who always gets the foul called against him. And that's what happened with Edwards. And in fact, the head ref missed it. The AR got it. The assistant referee got it. Called it in. Everything worked. I think of all the bad calls, that was definitely not near the worst. Okay. So, to summarize, after all of that... This was a win for the Fire despite their own best efforts. It's no coincidence that they started playing a lot better, scoring their goals after Shakiri is subbed out, after the DP strikers started getting actual service. They actually maintained much better possession that second half with Tehran in the game as a center back. He was pretty much able to shut down Joseph Martinez. Martinez had no real effect on this game from Montreal's perspective. Also, I think Kutsius has proven just in this one game that he is a much better option off the bench than Tom Barlow. Tom Barlow, when he was used for the Red Bulls, was used in very specific instances as a counter-pressing forward. Klopas wanted to use him, we saw him in the first couple games of the season, trying to either play for a draw or trying to preserve a lead. He's a defensive forward, at least in Klopas's mind, but Kutsius gives you, he can give you that. He can be as pressing a forward as Barlow can be with a little bit better of an offensive touch. So I think with all of that now, we have a little, hopefully Klopas takes that into account when looking ahead to New England. However, what I don't think he's going to take into account is putting Selassie on the bench to start because Selassie gets that just gift of a goal and stoppage time of the first half or right at the end of the first half regular time uh, that Sarah really needed to do better on. He just left his near post completely open, was really slow to react kind of an off-speed shot from Selassie, and it sneaks in by him near post, and that gives the fire a little bit of, of relief and a little bit of breath of fresh air, I guess, or a little bit of something, momentum maybe, going into halftime. So because of that, I think Klopas is going to be able to say, oh, Selassie scored last game, we're going to keep him on the starting. Even though he hasn't really been an effective player, he was much more effective last season coming off the bench, and I think Mueller is a better option starting. You've heard me say it before, I won't get into it all over again. He's a much more dynamic attacker, not afraid to take guys 1v1, has better service into the box, which is what Kuypers need. You don't pay a $12 million, you don't pay $12 million to a DP to have your winger be a primary scoring option. Anyway, all of that aside, let's take a look 
at the stats as we usually do here. I think we've talked about some of the major talking points here enough. The goals for the fire scored by Marin Haile Selassie, as I mentioned. Brian Gutierrez gets the penalty kick, which I loved. I loved his just quick run up, picks a spot, quick run up, blasts it. Beautiful goal by Gutierrez. Uh, Hugo Kuypers gets his first for the fire uh, off a nice header. And Kellen Acosta, obviously, the wind aided goal uh, to get his first goal for the Chicago Fire and a game winner. And I think because of that, he got MLS first team honors this week. What a wild goal. But he did have a really good game. Acosta really is a game changer for the Chicago Fire. The way he can control the midfield and the way he can kind of organize things. Slow things down when they need to. But it's funny because you have Shakiri, who's the complete opposite of him, who just wants to play balls forward, go as fast as he can, even if his striker's not ready or in the right position, or even if he's not playing balls properly to the striker. Anyway, we're talking about stats here, right? What am I, what am I bashing our, our star player, our captain for here, right? He doesn't deserve that, right? Anyway, statistically speaking, the Chicago Fire ended up with the majority of possession on the night, 59%, and they ended up, like I said, I believe, they, they ended up having all the five-minute possession segments that the, the MLS website breaks down, except for maybe a, a couple at the beginning and the end of the game. 59% uh, possession. This blew my mind. 22 shots on the night, 12 shots on goal. As you're going to hear from our friend John Donovan in a little bit, Shoot the ball, good things happen. It's the and I think the broadcasters on on the game said it. It's the old hockey adage, man. Put it on net, things will happen. Uh, the fire ended up with six block shots, so they were working real hard defensively for a while there. Five hundred seventy four passes, eighty five percent passing accuracy. This is the fire's best passing game without a doubt. And the fact that they had twenty two shots tends to tell me that they actually were playing the ball a little bit more in the attacking third. Imagine that. You bring the ball up, possess it in the attacking third, you end up with four goals. Whether or not they were good ones, it's still a fact of the, the way the stats worked out for them in this one. Nine corners, nine crosses, five offside calls against the fire. That, you know, I don't mind certain offside calls. When forwards, strikers, wingers, they're trying to stretch the back line when they're making their runs and then they're off just a little bit or you see the defensive line step up at the perfect time. I don't mind it, but there are a couple offside calls here where it was just like, Shakiri, why are you playing that ball? Or uh, I forget who it was, just waited a step too late while Shakiri of all people, made a run. And I think when he got called offside and that ball wasn't played to him right away, I think that was his... Moment of saying, I'm, I'm mentally checking out of this match. Uh, I think Salase had a couple times, or at least one time, where he was just hanging out offside. And, you know, the player just instinctively passes it to him. So, the Fire have to do a little bit better job in that area, at least. But, you know what? That's nitpicking after a 4-3 victory here. They won 27 aerial duels to uh, Montreal's 13. Uh, they had an XG, expected goals of 3. So they actually generated some decent offensive chances. But you got to remember, of those 12 shots on goal, 22 shots total, one of them was a penalty kick, which is usually given between a .79 and .89, depending on what statistical model you use. Uh, and then depending if it's weighted for post-shot expected goal or post-play, right, it, it goes a little higher. So the actual expected goal for the fire is probably a little closer to two if you remove that penalty kick. Um... So they generated offense in volume tonight. Now let's see if they can convert it to a more efficient offense uh, in the future. Brady was not credited with a save this match. Meanwhile, Montreal's keeper credited with seven. Um, three yellow cards against the fire, two yellow cards and a red against Montreal. Uh, so I guess you could say they were a little disciplined. I don't know on that one. Um, but again, getting back to the expected goals, they had a 3 XG uh, after 22 shots, 12 on goal. So that's the statistical breakdown. That's the storyline breakdown. Now let's let's talk a little post game here. Let's talk a little post game here because uh, Frank Klopas had a lot of quotes. Um, first of all, he talked about his 50th victory as the Chicago Fire head coach, which a lot of people were quick to point out. That's just the product of being the head coach four different times. Um, but here's what he says kind of looking forward. Maintaining momentum from the team's first win. Quote, yeah, I think that's a great question and a great point. Like I said, I think games like this and moments like this, they could be turning points for our team, you know? 
And actually, if you look at his locker room speech video that uh, the club put out, he says it. He goes, these are the wins that can change seasons. Now, that kind of tells me something because you're four games in and you're looking for a season-changing victory already? Hmm. Give us a little peek behind the curtain there, Frank, of what you're really thinking about how the direction of this team is and how they're playing and how you're coaching? Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Anyway, his quote continues. Because even though we played well enough and I told the group all week long, it's games that everyone expects you to win become the most difficult games to play. Oh, so they expected to beat Montreal. Okay, well, I guess that's that's good. Positive thinking, confidence there. Um, he continues. And you can just see how, not because we weren't ready and stuff like that, but it's a different kind of pressure on the group. Okay, to me that's just an admission. You weren't ready. Your defense was not ready. The team was not ready to play. So, of course, the first chance you get to address it, you say, oh, it's not like we weren't ready. It's just there's a lot of pressure on the guys. You think, Frank? You think? I think it's both. They were press They had a lot of pressure. They couldn't handle it. They weren't ready. And as a lot of people were pointing out, both on the broadcast and in social media and other commentary, when the team's not ready to play, that's on the coaching. Yeah, you guys know my opinion of Frank Lopez as a head coach. Anyway, um, he continues on. Now, you're expected at home. We needed to win the game. It was almost a must win early on against a good team. I take nothing away from Montreal, and they've proven that. But if you looked at the schedule and the teams that we played early on, you know, before they played the first matches, you would say, okay, this is a game that we need to take maximum points. So it becomes really difficult, and the expectations are like that for a team. Okay, Frank's just babbling at this point. Maybe he was getting out to the end of his presser. Um, this was one of the middle questions, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm not going to continue reading on his babble, but that gives you a little insight as to uh, what he was thinking throughout the game, pre-game, post-game, uh, things of that nature, right? So he, he's, I, I don't know what to say because I want to get into some of these other quotes, but I'm, I'm, I'm skimming them and I'm skimming my notes here. And honestly, like that's what, that's how Frank Klopas talks. It's a lot of disjointed coach speak and then he'll throw in something every now and then. Um, but here, here's another quote that I think is going to be indicative going forward and something to look for. Um, he was asked about his decision to bring three center forwards into the match in the second half, right? We saw Kutsius come in, we had uh, Kuypers there, and then did they also bring Barlow in at, at, at a point, I think? Yes. So here's, here's his reaction to that. He says, oh no, I did and it's a thought process. I'm not a guy that just, I don't know, maybe you do that in Vegas, but not here. It's a thought process. The thing is with Kutsi, Kutsi is last year, when we played 3-4-3, we used him as a winger. We did that quite a few times, even in New England. Looking ahead already. And he does a really good job joining in as a second forward. Gee, this is what everyone who looked at Kuiper's highlights videos in the, in the offseason, when they signed him, said. We need him with a second striker. We need someone to be serving him uh, balls from the wing. Uh, we need someone who can be drawing away other defenders. So this, I'm glad Frank finally figured it out after four games. Let's see if he does it against New England. My only fear is if he likes Kutsias in that 3-4-3, then we're going to go back to a three center back and just get burned uh, by New England. All right, then he says, once we brought Tom in and they got the red card, and then I think it was a really smart move from us because we kept only the two center backs. We played four across the middle with Maran and then uh, Alan Aragoni. Guti has a 10, and we played really narrow with the front three guys to be really supportive. So Frank is actually saying here the things that I have been wanting to hear, and so have a lot of Fire fans. We want two strikers, Kutsi is working with Kuipers, Guti is better as a 10, and with our two starting center backs, Tehran and Chihos, we have a, a better center back pairing, and we played much better. We're able to play narrow and focus the opposing attack into our center backs and into our center defensive midfielders there. So uh, I'm not, there were tons and tons of quotes that Klopas gave. Kellen Acosta gave a whole bunch of quotes. Um, after the goal, Hugo Kuypers gave, or after the game, Hugo Kuypers gave a whole bunch of quotes. I mean, imagine that, right? A win and everyone's talking, everyone's happy, everyone is upbeat. But again, did the fire really come out and play well this game? I don't think they did. They still struggled, struggled offensively, even though they had a lot of shots, uh, that were put on net. Most of those were in the second half after you saw some of the substitutes come in and after you saw some of those subs come out, you know who it is. All right, at this point in the show, we are going to pause for a quick 
water break and recognize our sponsor, Skira Icelandic Spring Water. Icelandic for clear, Skira water comes from a spring in a government-protected nature preserve in Iceland with naturally low mineral content. This isn't your average water. Clearly, pun intended, it's one of the best. I sure hope y'all stocked up on your Skira before St. Paddy's Day weekend. It's available at your local 7-Eleven. Go get it. Always have a few bottles lying around. Definitely good to keep you hydrated. And hey, even though there were some snow flurries around Chicago today, I like to think the weather is getting better and we're going to be outside a little bit more. So make sure you have your Skira ready to go with you wherever you are. And with our water break wrapped up, it is that time again to hear from our featured guest, my friend John Donovan on all things Chicago Fire and that victory against Montreal. John, take it away. Nick, Nick, John Donovan here talking about the MLS and the Chicago Fire. What a game, Nick. <clears throat> you know, it kind of reminded me when I was 10 years old, I remember I just kind of played one year of soccer. The men around really didn't know much about the sport. They were all football players. And a man by the name of Mr. Nobel from Switzerland came by and coached us for that year. I learned so much. But his, his constant statement was, shoot the ball, shoot the ball. The goalie just can't stop everything. So I really respected what Acosta did with that. I mean, floating the ball over a goalie that wasn't running into the ball was a big mistake. I've watched lots of goalies, coaches work with goalies, and their first statement, their first instruction is never try to stay underneath the ball because it'll float on you. Run into the ball, and you could see Cirrus uh, from Montreal just standing there and watching it. Maybe the wind at Chicago got a little bit, but I suspect that he did not um, do good uh, positioning for that that uh, shot. Really, what a statement! Two goals in overtime to come back. I mean, literally, very impressive. I love that uh, Tehran is back in the game. I like to see him healthy and and uh, used. I thought it was kind of odd that our boy um, Odsmeyer was not on the field at all. Kind of strange, but life will go on. Um, you know, the, the, the game opened up in the first 12 minutes. Chicago Fire had two penalty kicks against them, which unbelievable. I mean, that, the, the first one was weak, I thought, by Gasper, but the second one Holy Hannah, this guy Selquist is the pits. He's l lost one game last week when he literally fell asleep. And then this game, he had to try to make up and push the guy down from behind in the penalty area. Then look surprised. Unbelievable. This is a man that should be sent back to uh, Europe. How do we get these kind of guys in the fire? Um, just very disturbing. So the obviously the first 12 minutes was pretty rough for the fire. Um, Sejos did a beautiful long pass to Haile Selassie, who brought it down, controlled it, faked a shot, and Sirius, the goalie for Montreal, just whiffed on it. I mean, two goals against uh, Montreal um, that shouldn't have been. That goalie should have had that Haile Selassie shot. So you got to believe that Montreal is stepping it up to look for a new goalie coach. But the fire, you know, I was very impressed with uh, the the difference on the squad when Acosta's out there. He's a real good pro. I mean, he's he's got his mind about him. He's he's not hesitant at all. He uh, he's a big step up from Jimenez, I believe. Big step up. So, and then Herbers also is, seems to be a starter, which I've never been comfortable with. I've always thought he's a, as he was used in Philadelphia, was off the bench, but he's a, he's a tough guy. I know he's accumulated a couple of yellow cards, so we'll have to see how much more room he has before he'll go through a game suspension. Um, you know, I, I coach ice hockey, so I was not there during the game. I had to watch the game on rerun. And in the 77th minute, I turned it on and they were down three to one. And I just was thought, my God, Klopas is doing it again, folks. But, um, you know, they have some games coming up that they should win. New England is not playing well at all. I believe they play in New England next week and then they play New England back here again in a couple of weeks. 
So they should get those games. But they've got St. Louis in there. They've got Houston, which is a very good team. They've got Charlotte. They've got two games with Atlanta coming up. So where is the fire going to end up? They certainly have the talent on the bench. I mean, it's if they lose this season, it's directly on Klopas's head. He normally loses a few games. Then he'll come back and everybody will get a life. Um, he might get himself back into the playoff position. But then things have happened, which has happened in the last four years with him. Um, he never finishes strong. That's a problem. But he's got better talent. He's got good substitutions. Um, Brady is playing fairly well. I don't think he had one of his best games. I really don't. I mean, literally, you should be in the same direction of a shot and a penalty kick. That is normal. That's a norm in the industry. But uh, um, he didn't get that. One time he got a hand on it, but not strong enough, and it went in. So the Fire are, I believe, one game short of the playoffs right now. So, you know, if they can pick up a win up in New England, um, they'll be in the money, believe it or not. But I still believe that Klopas is luck. And I've seen him go for years, will... I hate to say this, finish out of the playoffs, guys. So we will see. Um, Nick, thanks for the opportunity to do the podcast and say hi to Mike. Take care, folks. John, thanks again for your contributions to the show. We appreciate all your insight, your reactions. Always love a good story from you. Talking about your soccer playing days back in the day, those nice developmental years for you there. I agree with everything you said. The Montreal keeper, Syrah, had a, a poor game on, on two major occasions uh, and kind of just generally. But, you know, Montreal really couldn't clear the ball for most of that second half. Um, and the fire did dominate the possession. So I'll give them the possession, but it still needs to come, I think, with a little bit more offensive efficiency. And they're going to need to do that in their next match when they travel to New England to take on the Revolution, their old playoff rival from back in the tw 2000s, 20, early 2010s, right? Man, I remember seeing it. I don't think it was in the 2010s. Both teams are making the playoffs, but definitely in the 2000s. I remember being at some of those games at SeatGeek, Toyota Park, Bridgeview Stadium, whatever you want to call it. Those were good times. Let's hope we can get some of those real kind of playoff atmosphere rivalries going again for the Chicago Fire as they hopefully continue to improve. Now, the Revolution are an interesting team this season. I said it in uh, my wrap-up show on Goals TV. Like, they are one of the most surprising teams for me for all the wrong reasons. Zero wins, zero draws, zero points in four matches. Not something I expect when you have a former MLS MVP on your team uh, in Carl's Hill. Not something I expect when you have a DP striker like Vrioni on your team. But they don't have the best defense, and their offense just isn't clicking. Uh, they're kind of middle to bottom in a lot of statistical categories when you look around Major League Soccer. But what sticks out, their expected goals aren't that good uh, either. So they're not creating as many chances as, as they had been in the past. Hill not getting those key passes like he normally does. Uh, but if you look at their progressions, their ball progressions, progressive passes, progressive carries, they are, I think, top five, if not top three, in MLS in those categories. So they still do have a pretty competent, a pretty solid midfield. Let's hope that Kellen Acosta can shut that down in this game. Maybe we see Jimenez get some minutes. Maybe uh, we see Pineda move up into a D-mid spot for just that reason. Now that Tehran is back and if he's fit for a full 90, though I anticipate uh, Klopas will probably keep Pineda on the bench to fill in if he needs to bench Salquist or Tehran uh, based on their performance and fitness. But anyway, back to the revolution. Uh, they are still very good at progressing the ball through the midfield, but their defense is letting them down. They are tied with Orlando City for the most goals allowed so far with 10. This could be Kuiper's breakout game, guys. This could be finally the time when we see him start scoring goals here. And despite veteran MLS backs in Dewan Jones and Kessler uh, in Lima, you got Mark Anthony K in the midfield, Ian Harks in the midfield. Uh, yes, that Ian Harks, that son of John Harks. Yep. Uh, this is an opportunity for Kuipers to really start to cement himself as, yes, that $12 million man. 
So those were some of the starters from New England's last game. They played a 4-2-3-1. Uh, you've got Ravis goalkeeping, and then left to right, Jones, Romney, Kessler, and Lima along the back line. Your mid defensive mids were Kay and Harks. Your attacking mids, uh, Shankly Hills and Balrock. I'm not even going to try it because I'm going to mess it up. And then Vrioni up top is your striker. Coming off the bench, Jonathan Mensah, Earl Edwards, Andrew Farrell, Spalding, Emma Boateng, uh, Tommy McNamara, Noel Buck, Nacho Hill. Now, Bobby Wood also would probably have been a good offensive option for them uh, in this last game. They had Vrioni as the lone striker up top. Really wasn't able to do too much on his own, though he did get some opportunities. He also did uh, earn himself a yellow card for one of his challenges, uh, I believe. Um, but this is a New England team that is just not put together, that is not clicking. They kind of look like the fire team for a little bit, and hopefully the fire have figured it out now going forward. But this is still a very dangerous New England team, especially at home. And if Carl's Hill is playing to his potential, if uh, the rest of the squad can just elevate themselves a little bit, this is going to be a challenging game for the fire. But what the fire can do is continue their possession in the middle third and into the attacking third and then just pepper that goal again. I don't think Ravis is that great of a major league soccer goalkeeper and that's how the fire can do it. Possession and, and peppering the goal, keep shooting and if that Kellen Acosta midfield can shut down Carlos Hill on the counterattack on the break and frustrate him or push him to the outside even. Let him have his dribbles. Let him have his space as long as it's on the outside. I think the Chicago Fire are going to be able to take advantage of this opportunity to get some road points against a struggling New England team. All right, and that's all I'm going to say about New England because I have been putting out hour-long episodes and y'all don't need to hear me talk for an hour. Why am I saying y'all? I'm not from the South. Just something that comes out. What can I say? Now, we're going to do that lightning round of headlines, like I said. A lot going on within Chicago Fire and CF2. First of all, remember when the Olympic roster was announced, Gutierrez and Brady were noticeably absent? Well, Chris Brady ends up getting uh, called up to the U.S. Olympic team, replacing Gaga Slonina, who had to uh, withdraw due to injury. So they will face uh, Guinea on Friday, the 22nd in Spain. Then they'll travel to France uh, to face France uh, in Mont Bellard on the 25th. And you can f watch those games on U.S. Soccer's digital platforms. So hopefully this is a great experience for Chris Brady. Uh, but now he will be unavailable for this New England game, it appears. Uh, so maybe that's another chink in the armor, right? That the Chicago Fire won't have their starting goalkeeper, who I've said in past episodes, has really made that team... Uh, look better than they are because he's been keeping them in games. So I, I'm confident in Spencer, Spencer Rishi um, being able to be that solid backup, but not having your starting goalkeeper might be a little shaky, might be some shaky moments for the back line. Let's see what other big fire headlines are out there. Um, per Alex Calabrese of Men in Red 97 Media, uh, the Chicago Fire 2 have a lot of familiar names and first team names available for their U.S. Open Cup debut match this Wednesday the 20th. Tom Barlow, Javi Casas, Jonathan Dean, Brian Dowd, Jeff Hall, George Kutsias, Fede Navarro, Yorgos Kutsias, excuse me, my accent got away from me there, Fede Navarro, Wyatt Olmsberg, Sergio Odahel, Spencer Ritchie, Arnaud Suquet, and Carlos Turan are all available for CF2's U.S. Open Cup match. Hey, maybe they decide to use Carlos Turan and get him a little, get him a few minutes there. Maybe he'll, he'll be get some fitness time. I don't know if he's traveling to England, probably not. Uh, but it's crazy to think that those kind of players are available as part of CF2 due to the limited minutes that they've had in the season so far. CF2 ends up playing Chicago City SC, 7 p.m. Central at SeatGeek in Bridgeview. Tickets are free. Get out, as they've been saying. Get to the geek. Enjoy the match. Also, Chicago action, Chicago House are playing Minnesota United 2, 7 p.m. Central at Elmhurst University, also on Wednesday night the 20th. Go check those out. Speaking of some Chicago Fire 2 players, Sergio Orajel gets called up to the U.S. Youth National Team under-19 squad. Uh, the Fire 2 have signed David Chichao Caro from Benin. Now, 
I'm not big on international soccer, and, and I'm certainly glad the Chicago Fire Scouting Department is, but Benin is a growing power in African soccer, so keep an eye uh, on David Chichao Caro on CF2. CF2 also have acquired uh, Christian Kofi uh, from the Spanish third tier, formerly of Monaco and Fiorentina. He's a winger. Andrew Goodman, back training with the first team. Great to hear. Misiel Rodriguez gets a loan to USL one team Union Omaha. And here's where a lot of people are kind of starting this debate now. Is it better for players to be with their MLS Next Pro team playing with MLS Next Pro competition? Or is it better for them to be loaned out to USL 1, USL 2 teams uh, and getting that kind of competition? What's better for their development? Now, on the one hand, if you're playing with your MLS Next Pro team, then you are within your club environment. You kind of get that uniform club training, uh, the desire to, or not the desire, the instruction for whatever the club is trying to achieve, what sort of mantra, what sort of philosophy they're playing, right? You get that. You're with your own coaching staff. You're with teammates, probably guys you came up with at the academy. It's much more comfortable, and it's much more dedicated to what the club wants to do as a whole. The flip side to that is when you're going and playing at, at these USL clubs, you're playing in front of a few thousand passionate fans. You're getting a little bit more of that atmosphere, and you're getting out of your comfort zone and might be asked to do a little different things than you would be with your uh, CF2 MLS Next Pro team. Uh, so a lot of people think that it's better for these kids who may have only known Chicago Fire Academy structure to go out into the USL and get minutes there on loan or maybe sign a USL deal and then try to get back to the MLS a season or two later. So a lot of different opinions there. As long as you're getting quality minutes with quality competition, I think that's the main thing. Whether you get it at the USL level or the MLS Next Pro level, that should always be the focus. Now, real quick, let's put our tin foil hats on here because this is the other wild conspiracy theory that has reared its head once again on social media. You've seen a couple MLS Next Pro teams, instead of just saying Chicago Fire 2, LA Galaxy 2, they're actually changing their name to a more particular brand where it's a, like an actual town or a club. And the ga I use the Galaxy example on purpose. I think their affiliate is now Santa Clara SC or Santa Clara FC. Uh, so some people are seeing that. And they're just kind of taking their, their anger and hatred towards Major League Soccer and saying, MLS Next Pro is rebranding, becoming a legitimate second tier of MLS because they're trying to kill USL. And that way it'll be MLS on top. And then you can do an internal promotion relegation just within Major League Soccer 1, Major League Soccer 2, currently MLS and MLS Next Pro. That is is kind of a crazy theory, but not one I haven't said could happen on this podcast and on the Sons of a Pitch podcast prior to doing this show. Um, yeah, it seems to be MLS's MO that they're just going to do everything themselves, right? Not a terrible business model, you know? Do it yourself. Own everything. Why would I outsource? Why would I want to rely on USL and other leagues to be the second, third division competing with me for first tier status? Why not just build it all myself? Heck, we can do it. We can do it. Let's build it better, right? So it's not the craziest idea. And honestly, if you want to see MLS growing, you already got 30 MLS clubs uh, with San Diego coming in uh, in the future. You're not going to add MLS clubs. You're going to have too many teams. So it's got to be done at the MLS Next Pro level or MLS 2 level if you believe the conspiracy theories. Oh my goodness here, we're, we're, we're burning time, we're burning time. What else is going on around the league? Uh, per Tom Bogert, there's a key MLS roster rule change that is in the works and is expected to be implemented this summer. I do think it's odd that they're changing the rules in the summer, uh, mid-season, but it's to get to the primary transfer window for uh, non-MLS leagues. The rule as it stands now is if you want to have uh, U22 initiative players, that means players who are under the age of 22, you can sign them to a higher salary. They're essentially, quote unquote, young DPs. Uh, in order to have three of those spots, one of your senior DP spots has to go to a young DP, right? And then you can build these U22s out. If you use 
your third designated player spot on a, a senior DP, on, on an older designated player, then you can't have all these U22 signings. So essentially, you're, they're separating that. This new rule is going to allow teams to have the three U22 initiatives, have the three young DPs, I guess. Uh, and and I, I know I'm kind of being very summary here, very uh, glossing over a lot of the finer roster rule and financial details, but essentially that's what it is you no longer have to reserve that third DP spot for a young DP uh, or U uh, and that will allow you to have the U22 initiatives. Now it's just going to be, you get your U22 initiative players. The idea is to invest more in younger talent. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully MLS teams won't just jump to South America or some of the lower European leagues and just start signing a bunch of guys there. Hopefully they will now use this opportunity to keep some of their own players from leaving, signing them to a little bit more lucrative contracts to keep them here and grow the league. That's what I would like to see. But again, these guys are business owners. It would not surprise me if you see the majority of them uh, using this to sign young guys to train them and flip them for a profit. Hopefully that's not totally the case. Whew, I am out of breath. I need to go get some Skira. I, I might need to go get a drink as well after this show. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I was firing fast and furious here. If there's anything you want me to go back and recap, please find me on social media at Glasshouse Soccer across all platforms, or you can email me glasshousesoccer at gmail.com. It's been great interacting with everyone. Um, Alexis and Israel and Paul and everyone else who's messaged me lately. Thank you guys. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Sorry I missed you at the Montreal game. I was the old man not wanting to fight the crowds in Chicago on St. Paddy's Day weekend. Uh, but hopefully I'll be out at the next one with some friends cheering on the fire to another three points. Um, last quick thing, just want to wish all of my fellow Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters a blessed Lent as we get on our Lenten journey this week. But as always, let's Go fire.